Because of the way the universe is created, we each of us live in two worlds at the same time. We have to live in the outer life of our own bodies and the inner life of our own souls. Hello and welcome to Living the Inner Life. I'm your host, Chris Sheridan, and I want you to join with me on a discovery process of exploration into our inner lives, this interior experience that we have, our thoughts, our beliefs, all the interior aspects that we use to interpret and take in everything that goes on in the outside world, and it helps us develop how we respond to the things and the people around us. Okay, now it's been said that the mind is the slayer of the real. The mind is the slayer of the real. Sounds a lot like a lyric to a heavy metal song, but it actually came from H.P. Blavatsky about 150 years ago. And I think what she's getting at is that if we over-intellectualize something, it can become too dry, uh, very factual, but devoid of feelings. And in doing so, we're missing out on a larger reality of things. Okay, say if you have a rose and an overthinking part of it might be to get the exact shade of the red color, uh, count the thorns, uh, analyze the DNA, weigh it, you know, all these faction figures that are true about this rose. And another way to look at a rose is to give it to somebody and see their reaction. Okay, both things are true, but if you get too much in the mind part of it, you're really losing out on a greater part of whatever it is you're involved with, okay? Now, there's a dance teacher uh, called Gabrielle Roth, and she developed this dance program called Ecstatic Dancing. It's very intuitive, very feeling. Uh, There aren't any particular moves or theory behind it other than letting the music move with you. And I've seen this, I've been to a couple classes years ago, and it looked kind of disorganized, uh, more than choreographed, uh, but it was actually kind of cool too. And she wrote in her book, Fumbling Towards Ecstasy, uh, about how she developed this theory of ecstatic dance. And apparently when she was a young girl, a young dance student, uh, the studio where she was practicing ballet looked over through his windows and it looked over a chicken farm. And one day when they were slaughtering the chickens, they were literally cutting the heads off and the chickens would run around. That's a true thing that actually happens. And she was watching that and something clicked in her and thought, well, gosh, if you just get rid of the head, the thinking part, then the body can just take over and do its thing. And dancing is a body thing, okay? And this also works in sports. You know, there's talked about, uh, well, there's a book called Skiing from the Neck Down. Uh, There was also another one from the 70s called The Inner Game of Tennis. And the guy that wrote that book and developed that theory, uh, one of his students was a teacher of mine years back. And the way he explained it to me was that in, I guess, the context of tennis, uh, they would take new students didn't really give them too much background or theory or technique, uh, maybe just how to hold the racket, but nothing really about the swing or what to do. The only instruction was when the instructor would be on the other side of the net, he would throw the ball and it would hit in bounds and then it would bounce and then the student would hit the ball. But they were instructed to watch the ball and when it first landed, on their side of the court, they would have to say out loud the word bounce, and then the ball would come to them and they would hit it, and when they say hit, uh, when they hit the ball, okay? And what this does, it keeps you from thinking too much, because now you have two things to think about, okay? Yes, you wanna see where the ball is going and you wanna hit it back, because that's kind of what tennis is all about, but you also had to be present, you had to be mindful You had to watch and wait for it to land on your side of the court and then, oops, say bounce. Now you're using your words and your mouth and everything to to get this word out. And then the ball comes and you hit it and you have to say hit. So you're remembering all this. And what this does, it occupies your mind just enough to keep you 
from getting lost in your thoughts or overthinking it. Oh, which way is the ball coming? Oh, what happens? How am I going to hit it? Am I going to hit it the right way? You know, all these thoughts can come in and thoughts happen very, very quickly. It's been said that you have maybe between a half a second and a second to either disrupt and stay in the moment and disrupt the thought process. Um, or after that, then you have every chance of getting lost in your mind and overthinking something. Okay. So what would happen? The students would do that. The ball would come over the net, bounce, hit, and they were actually doing a really good job because they weren't thinking entirely about their tennis game. They were really focused on their watching what they're doing and saying the, the right word at the right time. Well, what the instructor would do then is throw the ball to the other side, to the backhand. No backhand technique, no heads up, and they would go bounce and just naturally go into a backhand and hit it and say hit. And apparently they were able to develop young students, uh, or at least inexperienced students, uh, much further, much faster to get through that initial phase because you avoid the overthinking part of it, okay? And this can happen in a lot of other areas, too, in our lives, where we're prone to overthinking, where this overactive mind part, this intellect, uh, can really get in the way, especially if you're doing you know, something with your body, like sports or dance, or if you're doing something a little more creative, like acting. And this is something that I experienced in acting classes. I think it was like an improv class years ago. And you had the group of actors uh, would get together in a circle and you'd have a beanbag and whoever's line it was would say their line and then they would throw the beanbag to the next person. So they had to know who their scene partner was or who the next person is, at least after <laughs> their line. Um, and the concentration or even that brief part of concentration that was necessary to think, okay, I'm going to deliver my line and then I got to throw it over there to Steve. You couldn't entirely think about your line or your character or whatever it is you're doing because part of you was thinking, you know, I have to throw the beanbag when I'm done and you also have to actually throw it. So there was, you know, sort of a physical thing going on that normally wouldn't be in this scene. And then that person would deliver in their line. And if you're having a back and forth dialogue, they'd throw it back to you or off to the next person. So it helped you pay attention to the other person and know who you're delivering it to. But the exercise, I think, really taught you to be a little more intuitive and not overthink and overanalyze because it's so easy, so quick to get in your head. And again, I think this fell in that half second to one second span. Okay. So you're delivering the line and then you throw the mean bag when you're done to the person to whom I guess you're speaking uh, in the scene. So these tricks, these techniques are really used to get us in a position where we can't overthink things too much, where something like acting and to have a natural dialogue to make it seem believable <laughs> and realistic. Um, when we have a normal conversation, we're not really overthinking about what we're saying, you know, but if you're acting, you have to memorize a line, you're, you're portraying a character, you have all these other things that you have to process, but at some point you have to let that go and then just sort of be that character. All right. Or in sports, things like that. I know in sports, they call it talking about um, getting in the zone, right? So there's this zone where you're in a bubble and you're not really in your body. You're not really in your mind. You're just sort of one with the game and the play and whatever else is going on around you. And this can happen if you're a musician. It can happen um, if you're teaching <laughs> or really doing anything. You can get in this zone where you're very present and you're very involved, but you're not overanalyzing or overthinking or second guessing or worried about this or concerned with that. Okay. You're just focused on the task at hand. Now this can help us in really any area of our life. If we get too caught up in the thinking about things, 
All right. It's easy to come up with an idea, but sometimes it's difficult to follow through with that idea, with the actions that it takes to make it happen. All right. There's knowing better, but not doing better. There's 95% perspiration and 5% inspiration. You know, it's very easy to get caught up, especially in the inspiring part of it. Uh, that's a, another type of overthinking. You can overfeel something. And in your mind, and if you have a vivid imagination, you can create the pictures. You can actually feel the feeling of doing the thing that you're thinking about doing. And it can actually substitute the action that's needed. Okay. Now, I don't mean that you want to underthink things either or just set off and, you know, shoot at the hip and go in without really any kind of preparation uh, or consideration for what it is you're doing. You definitely need that. But what I'm talking about is that fine line where it goes from, oh, I'm being thoughtful and now I'm overthinking. Okay. It doesn't take that long for that to happen. All right. So it's a technique that can work even if we're not doing something like playing a sport or in an acting group or something like that. It can really work when we approach anything that we're thinking about or wanting to do. And what it does is keeps us from keeping ourselves stuck in the aha moment, in the discovery and that phase of developing something new. See, if you have a, an idea to start a business or say, I'll use my example with, with doing this podcast. Uh, actually, this took a long time for me to get to where I'm doing this now. I have notes from years ago. I had planned things out. I'm actually using notes uh, that I had developed a long, long time ago. Uh, but I never really, other things came up, but I never really took the action. You know, I thought about it. No, oh, it'd be great. And I have the name for the show, Living the Inner Life, and kind of had some idea of what I wanted to do, but I didn't really get around to it uh, until now. But what I had to really keep myself from doing was to then over thinking it. Okay, now I'm going to do it and I have to do tests and I want to make sure the camera and the lighting and my hair is okay because I'm doing this also on video uh, in case you're watching on YouTube or Spotify. Um, but, you know, mainly it's a podcast. It's meant to be listened to. Usually when you're doing something else and you're just listening in the background, that's how I enjoy podcasts. I listen to them all the time. I think it's a great medium. It's a great format. It's a great way to get something out and share it with other people. And I love sharing these things because when I've learned these new ideas or these, you know, really interesting ways of approaching life, ways of thinking, ways of feeling, ways of perceiving the world and myself in the world, I of course want to share it, you know, and, but I don't really want to share anything that I haven't tried, uh, things I don't really believe in. Um, certainly it's, it would not do anybody a favor if I were just saying, oh, well, do as I say, I don't do this, but hey, I'm just telling you that what you need to do. I'm kind of offering advice, but I don't really look at it as like that. I see it more as sharing with you something that I have found interesting and useful in my life, in my inner life, and by extension, in my outer life. So what I had to do is just at some point, and that would have been, I guess, in January, I said, okay, well, forget it. I'm going to, this is good enough. We're just going to go with it. And I had all kinds of notes and I prepared and I rehearsed and did all this stuff and that didn't seem to work. And then I just said, well, you know what? I'm just going to pick a topic, one I know something about and think it through. And, you know, I have some examples and maybe some you know, things to try, like a takeaway or a call to action at the end, and then just talk. Okay. I'm not even looking at notes now. I'm just looking at the little light on the camera and I'm keeping an eye on the clock to make sure I don't go over because it's easy for me to, once I get going, <laughs> to get long-winded and go on and on and on about something. I want to stay on track. Um, but this was a way that I could just, okay, then let my head get out of the way. Turn the camera on and just let the thoughts, let the feeling, uh, let the, the passion and enthusiasm that I have uh, for sharing 
parts of myself and things that I've picked up along the way because somebody shared them with me, a teacher, a book, a philosopher, you know, videos I've seen. Uh, and I'm glad they were there uh, to share that um, and write about these things or talk about them publicly because I've benefited from that. So maybe you will as well. And that's what I'm here for. I'm here to, here to share that and not overthink it, hopefully not overthink it too much and just get to what's real, get to what's behind it, you know, the passion, the feeling. So I am somebody personally who is prone to overthinking things. I also do have a very vivid imagination and I can trick myself into almost feeling like I did something without doing it, okay? And I think self-doubt, self-criticism, and a lot of these things, you know, fear of whatever, fear of a thousand and one kinds can get in the way. And if you let the mind go, if you get out of your head and really get into your body, because a lot of times most of what happens is in the body, okay? I know a lot of us live a life of the mind now. A lot of it's on the computer. A lot of it's talking, like, you know, I'm talking to you right now. Uh, but I'm using my body. Even if you're writing, say you're a copywriter or a blogger, you're still sitting down and you're typing or you're dictating or whatever it is you're doing. You're using some parts of your body. You're doing the action, even if it's fairly intellectual, you know, or a little bit heady. You're still, when you're doing it, you're still doing the thing. You're not thinking about doing the thing. You're not getting ready to get ready to do the thing. You're actually doing it, okay? Your feet are moving, your hands are moving, your jaw is moving, you're, you're typing, you're doing something, okay? Something actively, like the playing the tennis or you know, delivering the line at an acting troupe. You have to do the thing. Otherwise, then you're just thinking about it. So we can get stuck in our minds, okay? We can live in that fantasy world and never get to do the thing or take it that next level or carry it through all the way, okay? So don't slay the real, okay? With overthinking, over-intellectualizing. At some point, you know, there's really not much more thinking you can do before setting out to do something. Okay, you can't plan for every contingency. You can't be 100% prepared for everything before you start doing the thing. Because I guarantee you what happens almost every single time you do something, especially if you're doing something new, you're going to find out after having done it a couple times that, oh, well, this is a little different. And then you have to amend your plan or you have to adapt or somehow alter what you had spent all that time preparing for, and sometimes it, it, about half of it goes out the window and it's not even useful. Now, it's again, it's good to be prepared. That's really important because you never know when you might need to draw from one of these things. But no matter how prepared, no matter how well planned out you are with something, when you set out to do it, there's always going to be something different about it, something new, something, oh, well, gosh, well, now that I'm actually doing it, I'm finding out I don't need to think about these other things. Or, gosh, now that I'm actually doing this, I've learned that I need to pick up another skill or something like that. I have found out, and I'll share my personal thing, that with doing this podcast, I've been catching myself saying, okay, instead of okay, I go, okay. And it just, it reminds me of a South Park character uh, who says that all the time. And it's, it was kind of taking me out of the experience. I was like, oh God, what's, why, is, why is that guy doing that? You know, meaning me. Okay. Uh, I don't want to do that. So I will say, okay. So little things like that, but I, that's nothing I would have thought of. That's nothing I would have planned for previous to starting out and doing this. It only comes from the feedback and listening back to the tape and going, well, gosh, that sounded weird. And you can also say, well, gosh, that sounded good. You know, you don't know what's always going to work or not going to work, okay? No matter how planned out you are, you can plan things to death. You really can. You can plan the life out of something. Because again, if it's over-intellectualized, if it's over-prepared and you're over-scripted 
and it's very technical and very mechanical and you're worried about playing every single note just right, then you're afraid to make a mistake and then you're really not letting some of the feel come out, okay? The emotion, the passion, you know, this other element that is so important that makes the difference between something being sterile and clinical and something that's vibrant and passionate, okay? Ultimately, we want the best of both. You want the preparation and the skill and all the rational, logical thought process going into it, all the plans, all the contingencies. And you want the spontaneity. You want the fire. You want the live feel. You know, that it's vibrant and emotional. Right? And I know we've all heard musicians that are maybe technically proficient, um, but it's you're just watching somebody play a bunch of scales and Unless you're really into that kind of thing, it can get kind of boring after a while, you know. So hopefully I'm not too over clinical and sterile uh, and yet I'm prepared enough and there's some organization and plan that I am sharing with you when I do these podcasts. So think of that in your daily life. And unlike maybe the tennis ball coming at us where you have to say bounce and hit and bounce and hit. We have more time. Okay. We have that possibility of overthinking things. And so here's what you may do is when you have that first inspiration, whether it's to do a podcast or, or do anything else, keep that in mind, keep that in your heart that wow, that would be great. That would be fun. I could share all this and put it out there and send it out to the world. Don't stay there in fantasy land. You only really have to do that once. Okay. Get that inspiration, that passion, and then that inspiration, that 5%, and then spend all your time not staying back there. Spend the rest of your time working on doing it and then feeding back. If you put something out there, you can, if you can record it or somehow analyze it in a not too harsh and honest way, and then you can find ways to change and move forward and adapt and have something that is both well planned out and spontaneous and vibrant and exciting. And I hope you have that in your life. Don't overthink things. Get out of your head before you go out of your mind. And thank you for spending some of your time in your head and in your mind and in your ears with me here on Living the Inner Life.